Hey guys, this is Kevin Estella with Fieldcraft Survival, and in this installment for Eastman's Hunting Journal, I'm joined by a very good friend of mine, a seasoned outdoorsman, someone who spent some time in the woods, between the timbers, under the trees, under the stars, all that great stuff. It's my good buddy, Dwayne Unger, who is also our East Coast Lead Survival Instructor here at Fieldcraft. Welcome, Eddie. Thanks for having me. Appreciate yeah. it. Thank you for bringing your beard. That yeah. was messing up our mic. Thank you. No problem. <laughs> So uh, one of the things that we get asked all the time is, um, you know, I, I carry cordage into the great outdoors and, you know, I, I, I just tie a whole bunch of manipulations and rope and it kind of holds. How can I tie better knots? Well, we just recently completed a Wednesday night workshop. We had a very high attendance rate. We had like 50 or 60 something people and we showed them a lot of knots in a couple hours. And everyone was like, oh my gosh, I didn't know you could actually do that with rope. Well. What we're going to do in this installment is show you some of the knots that the hunter, the fisherman, the outdoorsman should know. Because I don't know about you, D, but I've definitely seen on the East Coast people driving home with, say, like a deer on like a trailer hitch rack. And it just looks like someone took a spider web of cordage and just threw it on top of the deer. And I mean, it was tied down, but it's like you said, if you don't know how to tie knots, you tie lots. Yeah, you tie lots. That's, that's what you see a lot of. So, uh, so let's just jump into this and I'm not even sure how many we're going to cover, but we'll go through a, a good number of them. And my recommendation is check out some of the other websites that are dedicated for learning how to tie knots, like animatednots.com, pick up the Marlin Spike Handbook, look up Mountaineering Freedom of the Hills. Uh, Dwayne's got a background in climbing. I've got a background in fishing and, and a whole bunch of other, you know, cordage related, uh, work areas. So I highly recommend that you guys adopt from other disciplines the knots will that'll make you a better outdoorsman and, and this is something that's a, a very perishable skill so you, you got to really once you start to learn the knots and try not to over inundate yourself think about learning one new knot a week and then once you learn that just stay proficient with it and move on and try to learn another new knot the, uh, the following week but once you stop doing this skill it's going to diminish and you're, you're going to find yourself uh, trying to remember how to tie these things again yeah and keep this in mind too uh, with all these knots you have the luxury of just clicking back on the cursor and rewinding this. If you're in class with us, we always tell you to record it, play it back later, because we're going to go very quickly. And a lot of these knots, it's going to uh, it's going to get to a saturation point. You're going to say, all right, I picked up three of them. I can't learn the fourth. I can't learn the fifth, whatever it may be. So please just make sure that you guys are going back. You're watching this step by step and uh, take detailed notes. I have a piece of cordage here. Um, this piece of cordage is one of our demo cords that we use in our, our courses. And I'm gonna just explain a few things that we need to know about cordage. Number one, it has to have three attributes to be good cordage. This comes from Richard Graves, the author of Bushcraft. Uh, his Bushcraft book was before Morris Kahansky's book, uh, another solid Bushcraft reference. But he said all cordage needs to have length, strength, and flexibility. You cannot have good cordage if you only have something that's long and strong but not flexible. We're not tying things to the roof of our car with tree branches because even though they have fibers and they're long and strong, they're not flexible. You can't have something that is long and flexible but not strong, right? That's like using grass for something life-saving. Uh, so all three of those attributes have to be there, length, strength, and flexibility. and you'll have good cordage. And that's whether it's natural or synthetic also. Another way of, of breaking down the types of cordage out there, right? Natural being jute, vanilla, sisal, synthetic being paracord, uh, braided fishing line, monofilament line, static, dynamic, climbing rope, you name it. Um, static and climbing, or ah, I can't talk today. It's too damn early. <laughs> static or dynamic? Uh, do you want to explain that one? Yeah, so a static rope is going to be similar to like what we have here where there's very little to no stretch in that rope. And then a dynamic rope is going to have stretch and give. Uh, so in a lot of the applications, especially from the hunting side of things, uh, the static line is going to do you best because as you're tying that, uh, that deer back to the back of the car, to the roof rack or wherever you're tying it down, you don't want to have a lot of stretch in that line. Whereas like with climbing, if you take a fall and you're falling 15, 20 feet down, you definitely don't want to have that static rope where it's going to stop you because you're going to wind up snapping your back. You want to have that flexibility and that give. Uh, paracord is uh, an example where a lot of people think when you grab a hole that you pull it, it's a very static rope. But in reality, there is some dynamic stretch to it. You try to hook up an anchor point, say with the hammock, and you sit it. And once you'll find out how much stretch is actually in, uh, in paracord, but that's the difference between static and dynamic. 
Yeah, and guys, a couple of rope management things. Uh, if you're going to cut cordage, make sure that you burn the ends. I'm a big fan of using, you know, here's my lighter, my little Exotac fire sleeve. Whenever I burn my cordage, I use the tip of the flame. And uh, I try not to let there be like a giant glob of melted paracord on here. Number one, because I don't want it burning on my hand. Number two, because that melted glob is going to be hard to pull through with certain knots. So I kind of get it going, blow it out, and then I use the metal part of the lighter to, to finish off this paracord. And now I have more of like a tapered end that is easier to, to pull through, right? Uh, you can just hit that up so it's nice and easy and clean just like that. So rope management, finish off your ends. Be very careful how you burn it. Another thing, don't step on your cordage. You don't want to grind little bits of sand in there. Um, if you get your cordage bloody, right, if you use that as, like, say, like a fish stringer or if you're tying down that deer, when blood dries, it's going to get hard. It's going to be harder to manipulate it. So you can actually wash your cordage um, with mild water and soap or okay, mild, mild soap and water. <laughs> you got to be careful with that extreme water, right? Um, so always make sure that you manage your, your cord. Um, and the list goes on and on. And a lot of guys are going to have winches on the front of their trucks. Um, so if you're running a synthetic line, same thing. Make sure that you're not uh, stepping on that. And you're definitely going to do some cord management with that too. Uh, when you're re respooling the, the winch line and also wash that out frequently because all the dirt are that you're guaranteed to be in in an off-road environment. Uh, you're going to need to clean that out. Yep. And guys, a couple last minute things before we jump into these knots. We're going to call that a bite. We're going to call that a bend. Right? So bite, bend. If I'm using this end, this is my working end, sometimes referred to the running end. Picture this end like spawning feet and running around, okay, like running through things. So it's the running end. This is gonna be the standing end. It's the part that is like the balance of the cord. Um, so remember that as I'm explaining this. If you hear me say take your running end, you know, use your standing end, go around the uh, this part, that's what that means. All right, here we go. With all these knots, anytime you put a knot, a bend, a hitch into rope, it's going to weaken it. You can talk to guys like our, our good buddy Austin, who's running the camera, and he'll tell you that there's a there's actually like an algorithm that will tell you just how much you lose in terms of strength with all these. Uh, but all these knots that we're going to show you have purpose. The way that we're going to present them, we'll show the knot, we'll explain the purpose. We'll show the knot again. All right. First knot, it's the foundation of all the knots that we're going to do, or many of the knots, is the overhand, where if I take my, this is my right, it's your left. This is my left, it's your right. But if I take my right and I cross over my left and I pull through, you've probably seen this on a million times. It's called the overhand knot, right? Not a bad knot. It's just basic, okay? But if I remember this knot, this overhand knot, I can change it a few different ways to make it more functional. I'm going to tie it around my leg. It's probably going to be easier for you to see. Here we go. So if I cross my right over my left and I pull through, this is an overhand knot. Okay. Now if I take my line and I go through once this way and once this way, this is called a surgeon's knot. Surgeon's knots are used by surgeons and they're used to tie off arteries and different bleeding bits in your body. So to tie that knot, we cross right over left, pass it through again, pass it through again, and now it's going to look a little something like this once it doesn't all get all janky on me. There we go. But that's your surgeon's knot. Do you, what overhand do you want to show? Square? Yeah, do a square. Right, do a square. So uh, same, same general principle here. We're going to start with our right over left, start with that overhand knot, and then we're going to go left over right. So we're tying that in the opposite direction that we just started. And it gets its name simply because once you do this correctly, it's going to form a square in the line. And you pull that down, and you're going to create a very symmetrical, very strong knot to either create a loop in your line, or this is a great piece to join two pieces of cordage of equal size and diameter. It's going to be a little easier for you to see with the two colors here. Uh, so we're joining two pieces of cordage together um, to create this square knot. Now what you can do with this, to play off of what Kevin was talking about with the overhand knot, this is a climbing thing uh, where we're doing the square knot, and then that overhand, I'm going to show you two different ways here. We can tie that overhand on the line, 
So we're going to run that work in, that tag in, back towards Kevin. And that's going to create a backup. So if this line starts to slip on itself, it's going to bite down and not allow that to run through. And I can't do it because it's not sliding. But I can either do it on the line or if I do just a simple overhand out here on its own, it's not as pretty or sexy. But yeah, it's, it's actually good. really ugly. It's good. <laughs> I prefer it this way. Yeah. But uh, it's going to do the same thing. So if that knot were to slip and fail, it's going to back itself up and bite down. So it's not going to allow that to uh, come undone. Yeah. So if you guys are carrying like 25 feet of paracord, someone else is carrying 25 feet, feet of paracord, you can use a square knot to join those. Very strong attachment. Or the innards, uh, if you need to tie it together to create one longer piece of uh, cordage out of that yourself. Very good. Now, guys, uh, you might have a piece of paracord, you might have uh, a larger line, and you might say, well, how do I attach lines together of two different diameters? Because if I try tying a square knot with a, this broad diameter rope and this piece of paracord, I go right over left, I tie a knot, and then I go left over right, and I tie a knot. When I hold this up and I pull this hard, it's going to slip right through. Well, instead of using the square knot, you're going to use something that's called the sheet bend. The sheet bend is where I'm going to use the thinner diameter cord as my running end. I'm going to make a hole right here, a, a, a bite with my thicker diameter. I'm going to come out of the hole. I'm going to go around the hole and then I'm going to tuck it underneath the paracord. This right here is referred to as a sheet bend and it's a friction knot because the harder I pull on that, that paracord, it kind of cinches down and doesn't allow the paracord to, to run through as if I were to use just a square knot. This is a great one if you have a larger diameter rope and you've got a thinner diameter rope and another thinner diameter rope after that. Well, now you've got the ability to, to attach those together. And that's sheet, S-H-E-E-T. Yes. You get a lot of questions on it. Yeah, no sheet. Sheep, sheep or sheet, <laughs> exactly. All right, guys, what I'm doing right here, uh, it just happens organically. This is how I manage my line. If I do little figure eights over my thumb and my, my pinky like this, right, I can then wrap around a few times. This is how I coil my line. You've probably seen kids take their iPods, not iPods, what, headphones. You now you can see how old I am, right? And they probably just do one of these. You've probably done this or maybe Okay, let's coil up the, the extension cord, put the Christmas tree lights away. But then when you go to get it, it's like... No, let's, just, let's show them what it looks like. Grab that out, out of that bag. This yeah, is, it looks like that. There's your Clark Griswold, that Christmas yeah. lights right there. But if we go back to that figure eight thing, this will never tangle on you if you do little figure eights. And I can do figure eights around my elbow, right? I can do figure eights around my, my fingers. If I have a long piece of line, I can do figure eights between both my knees like this, okay? Not uncommon to see climbers do that. Uh, but let's keep moving here with, with, these, with these knots. And I know we're gonna run out of time. This video could be hours and hours long. Well, I'm gonna show you another one that's uh, real applicable here with the uh, Canadian jam knot. Fire away. Again, we, real, real simple, we talk about the basic uh, overhand knot. In, in the applications here. So what we're gonna do here, we're gonna tie one overhand knot close to the end, and we're gonna cinch that down nice and tight, leave ourselves a couple inches of, of line. And then a few inches below that, just gonna tie another overhand, like such, and just leave that one opened up. So now what we have is, we're gonna wrap this around our, our deer on our, our hitch, or a, a bedroll system, sleeping bag, uh, wool blanket, whatever, and we're gonna run this back through, following the same line, and what's going to happen is as I start to tighten this down, that knot is going to start to collapse on itself. And then that stopper knot, that first overhand that we put on there, is really going to bite. And I'm not going to go because I'm going to lose feeling in my fingers. But you can really crank that knot down and it's going to hold. Is what they call a bushcraft zip tie. Um, and you can either tie this off so now it's a, basically a permanent knot or with this tag end that we left out here, if I pull that in the opposite direction, it's going to allow it to come undone. And there's the zip tie idea. So it's a real applicable knot, real super simple, because like I said, it's just nothing but two overhand knots and passing it back through. Yeah, so very, very, very uh, practical for the outdoorsman. Uh, guys, if you carry anything around your neck, you might worry about uh, strangulation. You might worry about uh, losing gear. Here's a very simple way of creating a, a good lanyard for around your neck. 
What I'm gonna do is tie a fisherman's knot. So I've got these two pieces of cord. I want the two ends. Okay, they're both gonna be running ends in this case. They're gonna work in opposite directions. And you're gonna notice that this one in my right hand is gonna be tied going left. This one in my left hand is gonna be tied going right. I'm gonna tie over itself and I'm gonna go in this direction. Here's one. Now I'm gonna take this running end and I'm gonna tie going the opposite direction. Two. What is beautiful about this knot is it's adjustable. So if this is around my neck, right, I can adjust it to ride, you know, say like in the middle of my chest, waistline, whatever. It's also a very strong way of attaching uh, a rope together. Okay, so if you're a fisherman, you might extend your line by doing it this way, right? And you can do single, double, triple, quadruple fisherman, but the single is usually plenty strong. Um, and it's a very strong knot because it's super symmetrical. So that is the fisherman's knot. Uh, and if you are wearing anything around your neck, number one, you shouldn't be running through the woods. Number two, tuck everything inside of your shirt. You'll never have it snag on anything. And if it does snag on something, guess what? You can just kind of work your way out because it's gonna stretch. Let's, go, let's show the water knot. Water knot. Um, then we gotta so wrap this thing up. We're short on time already. Oh yeah. Wow, okay. Yeah. So time flies when you're having fun. So you guys may be dealing with some webbing. The, the absolute best way to tie two pieces of webbing together to create a much longer piece, or in this case, we're gonna create a, a loop here, is again, we're gonna get right back to that overhand knot. Super simple here. So we're going to, on one end, tie an overhand into this webbing, leave this nice and loose, make sure that nothing's pinched over or curled or twisted or anything. And then we're simply going to retrace that with the opposite end. So if I come in from at the tag here, I'm gonna retrace, keep the, everything nice and flat. Come around. So you see everything's retraced back on itself, very symmetrical. And I just simply pull that down. And that is your strongest knot that you're gonna get in a piece of webbing. What Dwayne just did right there where he was making sure things weren't twisted and everything was symmetrical, it's called dressing a knot. Uh, it's so your knot looks like it's symmetrical. Remember, symmetrical is gonna give you strength. So if I just tie this overhand loop like this, Right? I can tie it where it is nice and symmetrical, it looks pretty, or you've probably tied this knot before where it probably looks something like, like, I, like yeah, here we go. Like this one rolls over this, and this one's all beat up. It's like, oh yeah, look at my knot. Well, that knot is not gonna be as strong because it's not as symmetrical. So what I can do is I can dress it up, make it look like it is all symmetrical, and it will be much stronger. And the same thing like with the, with the webbing, I, I would take the time and I would actually make sure, I would run this out to make sure that it's gonna create a perfect flat loop that I don't have a bunch of twists and everything into the webbing because again, it's all about the strength. Yeah. Guys, we've got one more. That's the bowline. Now I tie a bowline different than Dwayne ties a bowline and there's a lot of different bowlines that are out there. Um, <laughs> my mentor, Marty, said that I would tie things left-handed when I came to the bowline and it's true because I'm using the left hand in this case as my hand that's running my my line and I should be using my right. So Marty would say that I tie my bowline backwards, which I get it and I do. Dwayne will show you his version and I'll do that up mine slower um, one more time. But the bowline is going to uh, create a loop that's not going to close. So what I do is I make a figure nine, right? It looks like a nine. And you've probably heard the expression, rabbit comes out of the hole, goes around the tree and goes back down through the hole and then you pull the standing end. Well, there's another expression. Remember, I have a background as a high school history teacher. So this is your teacher. You poke your teacher in the eye, you strangulate your teacher, and then you poke your teacher in the other eye, and then you hang your teacher. That's horrible, isn't it? I don't, but maybe there's a reason why I'm not a teacher anymore. Maybe, maybe. All right, go ahead. I think you're a lot better. No, same, same idea, but uh, again, we're going to come around. I'm going to make that, I'd, I'd make my figure nine opposite of what his is because I'm doing mine right-handed, the, yeah. the right leg. Nine out of 10 people will do it Dwayne's way. Exactly, so then you're gonna do exactly that. You take the, the rabbit comes up out of the hole, goes around the tree, and then back down the hole again. And then you're simply gonna dress that up, make sure everything's looking good on here. And this is something, again, from a climbing background, even though that, that is a bomber not gonna come apart, we would always back this up with an overhand. Remember, it was all about backup. Um, and that, we're out of time, I know, but uh, all these knots can be tied with uh, quick releases yet too, which that's yeah. a different category. Yeah, but, uh, and guys, we didn't even get into making your own cordage. We didn't even get into uh, braiding cordage. Uh, 
help. We could really we, geek we, out. We could geek out for I'm, hours I'm, on this stuff. <laughs> this this is, this is our our show. Real quick, if you guys have never braided cordage, I'm just going to show you very quickly, and then I'm going to say goodbye because we got to go. Um, but I'm going to take three pieces of line. I'm going to use three different colors just to show you. I'm going to tie. Guess what? Another overhand knot in this, and. Now I have three pieces of cord like this. D will hold it up, okay? All you have to do to braid cordage is take the outside, put it to the inside. Take the outside, put it to the inside. Outside, inside, outside, inside, outside, inside, outside, inside. And eventually, you're going to get a braid. Now you'll notice as I'm doing this, these ends, they tend to get braided. But guys, this is one way of turning your cordage into much stronger cordage by braiding, okay? Should know how to do that. All right, folks, listen, we're, we probably went way longer than we should have. Um, all I'm gonna say is learn knots, right? Knots are a great way of demonstrating skill. Every hunter wants to show how cool of a, of a, of a shooter they are, how good of a shooter they are, but I'm gonna tell you that if you tie good knots, uh, you're gonna demonstrate your capability and you're gonna see how uh, valuable and utilitarian good cordage is. So thank you so much for watching. Thanks to Dwayne Unger for joining us today. Me. And uh, we'll see you next time, guys. Hopefully we're on the fire. Take care.